Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome you all to this AIS channel presentation on the true minimally invasive way to treat symptomatic BPH, specifically talking about the temporary implantable nitinol device, the ITIN, as treatment for bothersome lonely tract symptoms secondary to benign prosthetic enlargement and bladder outlet obstruction. My name is Neil Barber. I'm a urologist from Surrey uh, in the United Kingdom, just outside of London. And I've been involved with this device now for a number of years, including uh, one of the early trials, MTO2. So what is ITIN? Uh, ITIN is a device uh, employed in the treatment of lonely tract symptoms due to BPH. It is a device which is temporarily placed within the prostatic urethra and across the bladder neck for five to seven days in an ambulatory fashion. And the concept of it is, is that it is made up of three pressure struts that create longitudinal ischemic, ischemic incisions at 12, 5 and 7 o'clock, aiming to remodel the prostatic urethra and bladder neck, that is the bladder outlet, to relieve obstruction, increase urinary flow, and of course, most, most importantly, improve lower urinary tract symptoms. Today, we're going to talk about different aspects of the devices, but I want to reinforce that this is not a new device. Uh, the first picture on the top right there is the version one of the i and you can see that was made up of four struts. And the first one-year data was uh, published out of Professor Francesco Porpilia's unit in Torino uh, nearly eight years ago now. Thereafter, the second-generation device and the bottom right hand there came along, and that's made up of the three struts that I described in this positioning leaflet. And all evidence based following that was based upon using this device. We're lucky enough today to uh, have uh, a number of experts in this uh, field. Dr. Silvia Secco uh, from Milan, Dr. Luca Cindolo uh, from Rome, and uh, Dr. Bilal Chuktai from uh, New York. The aims of the presentation are both to cover the mechanism of action of this device, understand best patient selection in terms of, in terms of who you may offer it to, discuss techniques of deployment and removal of the temporary device, and then reflect upon the supporting data and clinical evidence from the high quality trials available, and particularly from Dr. Chukdai looking at the prospective multi-centered randomized trial versus sham, MTO3, in which he was involved. We will then also discuss uh, the best way to learn to uh, deliver the procedure in terms of a training pathway, and then finally, hold a discussion uh, in terms of understanding uh, all these aspects of this device um, and what place it may have in the future in the surgical management of men suffering with symptomatic BPH. My name is Silvia Secco, and I'm an Italian urologist based in Milan. Minimally invasive surgical techniques are among my favorite fields of interest, and it's really a pleasure to be involved in this episode dedicated to ITIND. In this presentation, I'll talk about patient selection. These are my disclosures. Well, I do think that a correct patient selection is the most important break, the one that supports the entire procedural success in the medium and in the long term. And the success is our aim, our goal, both for patients and for clinicians. To select a patient in the best way, it's mandatory to keep in mind two different points of view, two different perspectives, the patient's one and the urologist's one. Let's start analyzing the doctor's point of view. So how can we be happy using the ITIND? These are the indications. ITIND implantation 
can be suggested at any age in all the BPH symptomatic patients that suffers from medical treatment side effects that are candidate to surgical treatment without BPH complications, for example, stones, diverticular, mm -hmm. high post-voiding residuals, including Marion's disease. Mm -hmm. In particular, I think can be the perfect answer to young patients who do not respond to medication therapy, but that are keen to maintain ejaculation. Prostate size has to be smaller than 60 milliliters, and there has to be a normal detrusorial function. High blood or neck can be treated too. Well, we'll see later the contraindications. All these criteria are sustained by many clinical studies that have been published since the release of the ITIND. ITIND is a very, very smart device that has had and is still having a design evolution. This is the first published study involving men, and I'm happy to say Italian men, that evaluated the first available ITIN device that was made by four single layer struts and had a silicon distal tip. Looking at the inclusion criteria, like, yeah, okay, we can see that the mean volume of the prostate was 29.5 milliliters. The results achieved with the very first device were really exceptional, both in terms of IPSS and QMAX. I have mentioned the word evolution, and evolution is growing. This is what has really happened to our ITIND. So the first device generation has been improved to the second one. Uh, sorry, I really love flowers, and seeing ITIND, a tulip always comes to my mind. Look at this shape. In fact, the second generation has three single layer struts, no distal tip, and this is the one that is now commercially available. Since the first publication on the second IT generation, and in this case, we've got a multi-center prospective single arm studies involving nine sites, and again, demonstrating excellent results achieved, but treating patients with larger prostate, uh, lots of studies have been released, but you will see specifically in the section dedicated to clinical evidence on 18. I only want to underline that the mean prostate volume was from 30 to 45 milliliters. So the message is that if you properly select the patient, you will have excellent long-term results with very few adverse events that typically are mild and transient, mostly Clavian Dindo grade one or two. Well, now let's have a look at the contraindications. The presence of an obstructive medial lobe, it's a contraindication. A narrative urinary infection is a contraindication too, but also the presence of urethral conditions or devices for example, an artificial urinary sphincters that may impair the deployment of the device. Since now we have spoken about prostate size, but remember that also shape matters. And remember that an obstructive medial lobe is a contraindication, but not the presence of a high bladder neck. Mental disorders are surely another relevant characteristic of which clinicians have to be aware. As a matter of fact, it's important that the patient don't try to pull or to remove or to cut the polyester retrieval sutures because you will manage it, but it's better if it don't, doesn't do it. Well, I think that the urology satisfaction with ITIND is very high. And throughout all the presentation, you see that ITIND is a very easy procedure with a short learning curve that can be performed in an outpatient setting with a high grade of patient satisfaction too. And now let's focus on the patient's points of view, the other one. This is definitely as relevant as the clinician one. And this has been demonstrated through all these years because starting from the 90s, a big revolution is going on. In fact, there had been a progressive change from a paternalistic model to conceive the medicine to a deliberative model in which the patient is involved into the decisional process and has the space to share his ideas and his thoughts. 
Today, more than ever, it's mandatory to integrate the clinical evidence available, the individual clinical experience, but mostly the clinical status and the patient circumstances. This is well pointed out also in the guidelines and in the scientific papers, which nowadays are not only the prerogative of doctors, but contain a session dedicated to patients. Patients' perspectives and fears can vary different from what we would expect, and their decisional process can be influenced by factors that we would have never expected. The perception of the BPH treatment results are not always the same between doctors and patients. Remember this. So it's important to individualize the treatment. The so-called tailored medicine is exactly this. We need to carefully listen and to understand to the desires, the needs, the expectation that the man that is in front of us has. Nowadays, more than ever, Patients want visible results, they want benefit, they want no side effects, they want to avoid the prostatic cutting, they want to maintain the ejaculation, they want a rapid recovery, they want to avoid complications, they want to sometimes be treated in unconventional treatment, they want to avoid general anesthesia, the catheter, and also the operatory room. So to conclude, I do think the ultimate selection that leads to the best outcome is the results of a balancing between the two different points of view. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to present on ITIN temporary implantable nitinol stent for BPH, and we're going to dis we're going to discuss the role of it with flexible cystoscopy. These are my disclosures. As we know, ITIN is a temporary implanted stent that's placed only for five to seven days. It creates deep bloodless incisions created through ischemic necrosis, uh, permanently remodeling the prostatic urethra and bladder neck. This innovative and elegant solution has been approved by the FDA in 2020. The iTint is a single-use device supplied on a dedicated delivery system comprised of three nitinol cutting struts, one at 12 o'clock, 5 o'clock, 7 o'clock. It's approximately five centimeters in length and three and a half centimeters in height. The anchoring leaflet at the six o'clock position is there to prevent device migration. And there's a retrieval suture that's anchored at the distal part of the device for easy retrieval. Here we can see the diagram of the nitinol stent as well as the anchoring leaflet. And on the bottom picture, we can see how the eye tint is then subsequently placed and the retrieval suture, which is um, uh, external to the body and external to the urethral meatus. The ITIN system is non-permanent, removed at five to seven days, rapid symptom relief, low catheterization rates, and it can be implanted using either a rigid or flexible cystoscope. Today, we're going to cover the uh, role of it with flexible cystoscopy, and it can be easily done in the office this way. And in the images here, we can look at the deep bloodless incisions that, that are created approximately um, you know, seven days after the procedure and then are long-lasting. We're going to go over how I do it. And as we see this diagram here, it's very complex, but the I-10 system is very simple and easy to perform in the office and requires very few additional, additional parts. So for patient preparation, you want to uh, position the patient in dorsal lithotomy and drape them for normal cystoscopy. 
uh, intra intrauterine lidocaine, two uh, percent, and the penis is then clamped for ten minutes. Anti -pro uh, antibiotic prophylaxis, as per the uh, local antibiotogram. For patients who are more sensitive, you can consider diazepam or oxycodone or Celebrex. For, mo for most patients, I still perform a prostatic block just to help ease the um, procedure itself. And I do place intravesical lidocaine through the scope during the procedure prior to the itin uh, 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 positioning. And some have also described the use of nitrous or penthrox without requiring IV uh, medications or monitoring of vitals. Here's a video of us placing the flexible of the eye tinted with a flexible cystoscope. So here we get started. This is me placing the flex. We're doing a flexible cystoscopy, getting past the urethral sphincter. Here we can appreciate the ejaculatory duct and the lateral hypertrophy and high bladder neck. Following this, the um, inter, uh, the lidocaine is then instilled inside the bladder. And keep in mind, this is done after the prostatic block and the lidocaine jelly is inserted inside the urethral meatus. Following this, a flexible guide wire is then placed inside the bladder so that the um, urethral axis sheath is then easily placed um, into the bladder. So here, using Seldinger technique, the um, real axis sheath is then easily placed inside the penis, right past the bladder neck. Uh, you know you're in the correct position because you get an efflux of a small amount of urine. The eye tend is then uh, advanced into the bladder neck. You'll feel the, you'll, you will feel the eye tend pop as it is um, deployed inside the bladder. And following this, the um, Flexible cystoscope is then placed back in to confirm the correct position of the eye tin. Here we can see it placed just um, distal to the bladder neck, and all the anchoring leaflets are correctly placed. Then the scope is easily removed. The sheath is then um, removed, and the uh, uh, and then the um, retrieval suture is then uh, left at the tip of the penis. While the eye tint is in place, you want to consider having patients on peridium uh, up to three times a day as needed. Consider NSAIDs or Tylenol. Don't exceed the maximal dosing. For patients who are having more discomfort, you could consider either codeine, uh, consider a, a Medrol dose pack, or oxybutynin. The retrieval of the eye tint is pretty straightforward. Uh, this video is uh, courtesy of... Um, of, of a Dr. Altman as well. Here we just prep the catheter and the retrieval snare. This is the end of this um, the catheter, noting that it's open at the end to allow easy retrieval and compression of the ITIN device. Uh, this is a video of Dr. Altman prepping the catheter itself, making sure there's adequate lubrication so everything slides very easily in. The retrieval snare is then prepped and placed inside the catheter itself. And here is the retrieval suture um, attached to the retrieval snare. And this is all done external to the body. Once the retrieval suture is placed right through the catheter, the catheter is then placed into the penis. Advance till you feel the eye tint itself, which is approximately two thirds of the catheter itself. Following this, you apply gentle pressure to cause the eye tint to collapse within the catheter, which we see here ex vivo. And we can see how easily and neatly the eye tend compresses. And the whole apparatus is then removed and block. And here we see it compressed within the catheter. After removal, most patients have immediate relief of symptoms. A small percentage may continue to have mild dysuria or hematuria for up to two weeks following the procedure. Most patients experience improved stream immediately and ensure the patient's void prior to discharge. I typically see patients four to six weeks after removal. From this, we're able to conclude that this minimally invasive FDA-approved procedure is effective and well-tolerated while still preserving ejaculation and erectile function in men. Thank you.
it is a great pleasure for me to be here to present my experience on the IT procedure using the rigid cystoscope. I will present the technique, uh, the advantages of this device, the limitations that can, you can experience, and also I would like to summarize my personal experience. The device uh, of ITIND is a, a temporarily implanted needle device that is able to uh, reshape the prostatic fossa by an atermic uh, dilatation and incision of the blood and neck. It is um, built with three needle arms that once in situ is, are able to enlarge at 5, 7, and 12 o'clock position the blood and neck and the prostatic fossa. In this device, it is very little device, is attached with a polyester retrieval suture for the removal of the device one week after the implant. And there is a new specific part of this device, the so-called anchor leaflet at six o'clock position that is very important for the stability of, and the maintenance of the device in the right place during the week of the implant. The mechanism of action of the ITIN is an thermal dilatation and incision of the blood and neck, as you can see in the picture below. The initial view shows the blood and neck of this patient contracted with no space for the passage of urine. But after the implant, as you can see, the, you can appreciate some groove at 12, 5, and 7 position in the blood and neck, meaning an increase of the diameter of the prostatic fossa and an increase of the urinary flow with consequent impact on the symptoms. The reason why I needed to have IT in my hands are essentially the need of offer to all kinds of patients uh, and with different sizes and kinds of prostates, smart solution that allow us to perform a nice surgery with a very limited presence and permanence in the clinic or in the hospital for these patients that suffer from a very um, burden um, symptoms. The patient selection uh, is the key of the success of all kinds of surgeries, but in this specific case, we have to look at the inclusion criteria of the studies uh, who, that explored the clinical value of IT. Several studies during the last eight years included patients with prostate volume about 30 to 60 milliliters with good detrusion function, with LATS moderate to severe, uh, with or without blood and neck, but for sure without a median low. The prostate volume examined in these studies were about 40 grams, and the IPSS was significant. Of course, we have to look carefully to the PDR in this kind of patient, because to have a neurogenic bladder or a severe impairment of bladder function could be a good reason to exclude the patient for this uh, device. But for all the wide majority of patients suffering from uh, urinary symptoms, the ITIN is a very good solution. The implantation technique is very simple. I'm proud to present this technique by rigid cystoscope because the rigid cystoscope is very common in all the urological operatory theater, and especially because this uh, technique is, could be very uh, learned very fast and is very uh, simple to duplicate. Of course, we need a 19, a rigid cystoscope, 19 to 25 Charrier, with an optic of 12 or even 30 degrees, we need to perform this procedure under a very mild uh, sedation. In my clinic, I prefer a, a protocol of mild sedation, but after 
training, you can also use a pure local anesthetic approach. Of course, we need uh, lubricating gel, surgical drain, and put the patient in a lymphatomic position. Overall, the entire procedure, including sedation and patient setting and positioning, typically takes no more than 20 minutes. Is a technique that duplicates a cystoscopy. You can see in the next video the technique. Here I present a real case of a man of 70 years with a previous aorto coronary bypass in good clinical condition. He's an active, sexual active, no smoker, under cardioaspirin, with an important uh, symptomatic profile with uh, moderate impact on QOL. He was under alfuzosin, but he was completely uh, not satisfied. His PSA, PSA the uh, regional examination were normal. The prostate volume was 27 cc's, and his uh, urophlometry pattern showed an impairment of his urophlometry with 100 milliliters of PDR. After a long counseling, after a flexible cystoscopy, we decided to propose to offer this patient uh, the ITIN implant, and you can see this sequence in the next video. The procedure requires a cystoscope sheath of 19 French or more. Under vision, pass the cystoscope into the bladder. Fill the bladder with sterile saline. Check the urethra and bladder for contraindications. Withdraw the telescope. Insert the eye tinned folded within the introducer sheath. Advance the eye tinned until the device releases into the bladder. Withdraw the introducer sheath. Remove the cystoscope sheath while keeping the eye tinned in the bladder. Under vision, reinsert the cystoscope. Fill the bladder with saline. Orient the anchoring leaflet to the 6 o'clock position. Pull the cystoscope back until the bladder neck is visible. Pull the eye tint back into the prostatic urethra. The anchoring leaflet should sit at the base of the bladder neck. Loosen the slip knot or cut the end of the guide wire. Slide the guide wire off the retrieval suture. Loop the retrieval suture. Loosely fasten the suture. After the implant, 
the patient is discharged a few hours later and he's discharged to, to go home. Um, he's normally counseled to drink a lot and to take some drug for the pain management, especially in case of spasm of, or perineal pain. One week later, we uh, accept again the patient for the removal procedure. The removal procedure can be done in general anesthesia or short intravenous sedation, that is the technique I prefer, or even by local uh, anesthesia, especially after an appropriate training. To retrieve the device, we need the retrieval snare, that is a metallic wire that is useful to capture the stitches and to pull out the device into this open-end 22 French silicon foley catheter. Normally, this is more than sufficient. It's very easy to remove the device, but sometimes it can be needed uh, the uh, use of a rigid cystoscope in case of pain or uh, discomfort of the patient. Normally, this is a very fast procedure that typically takes two minutes. A snare and a 22 French silicone Foley catheter are required. Lubricate the Foley catheter. Feed the snare through the catheter. Use the snare to thread the retrieval suture through the catheter. Insert the catheter until it meets the eye tint. Retract the eye tint into the catheter. Remove the catheter. The eye tint creates three channels that allow urine to flow better. One month later, after the removal of the implant, we reevaluated the patient, and this patient was very happy and satisfied because he preserved his anti-grade ejaculation. He stopped the use of alfusosin, and he showed a very good urophlometry with our PDR and a significant improvement in terms of symptom control. He experienced also a mild and self-limiting hematuria because probably he was under cardioaspirin and he was prescribed to stay under cardioaspirin during his uh, follow-up. The mean results we can appreciate in terms of IPSS reduction, in terms of Qmax increase are shown in this slide where we can appreciate, uh, as you can see here, at four, six weeks of follow-up, a significant improvement of uh, the, the, the symptom scores. What is more important, in my opinion, is that the different studies that evaluated different kinds of patients had the same results, confirming the efficacy of this device, even in different clinical settings and patient selection.
My experience up to now consists of 12 implants in 12 patients with one year follow-up. I personally examined this patient performing uh, examination, uroflometries and questionnaire. So the follow-up is done very carefully. And what I have learned, what I can suggest is to perform a very good preoperative counseling. The key of success in my hands is in this preoperative phase because the patient should understand perfectly what are the, his expectations, but all what are our possibilities. Uh, usually, I perform uroflometry and uh, I recommend to do a cystoscopy by flexible or rigid. This is irrelevant as a mandatory examination. About urodynamics and even electromyography, I will say this is not uh, uh, for all the patients, but in the cases where you su uh, suspect perineal hypertonia or even dyssynergia, patient with a specific profile, you can think at that because here you can find the right answers. Of course, when we implant the patient and some of patients suggested me to be even more uh, active in this, uh, in this phase is to prescribe an adequate pain management because the first week could be, could be sometimes even difficult for the perineal pain or this very um, discomfort with the implant in situ. The rigid cystoscope is not necessary to remove the eyeting, but you should have the possibility in case of problem. What I've learned after this small experience is that the eyeting is a very smart solution that allows to ensure a patient a very good and fast recovery of urinary well-being. Of course, the optimal results can happen also after three, even four months post removal. So sometimes we have to wait. We have to wait and support the patient even during his week with the device in situ. And we have to be patient with the patient, uh, encouraging the, the first three months before a proper reevaluation. The I think work as an incision of the bladder neck, but probably the IT is better because the incisions are athermal, are divided in three arms. The implant technique is very easy. There's no learning curve, but it requires a very good knowledge and understanding of the clinic and patient expectations. The procedure is very fast, it's speedy. There's no waiting list and the hospital stay is very short. But the counseling should be done with, with great attention. In the clinical studies, we learned that the prostate volume of patients included is less than 80 milliliters. But in my setting, in my hands, the patient with the prostate volume no more than 40, 45 cc's without a protruding medial lobe are very good candidate for this good technique. Thank you very much for your attention. Good morning, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to discuss the role of ITIND and the question being OR versus office. Um, how do you decide between the two and where is ITIND best deployed? So it's going to go over uh, how I do it in, in my office and, and in my OR. So just to remind everyone, we're going to follow standard AUA guidelines with a medical history, physical exam, completion of validated questionnaires, including uh, IPSS, a Euroflow study, volumetric assessment of the prostate, and cystoscopy prior to any procedure. Patients, again, are positioned in dorsal thalamic position. 
for normal cystoscopy, consider local and oral anesthetics, including interurethral lidocaine, antibiotic prophylaxis, uh, oral sedation if needed, and prostate blocks depending on the patient. Now, when doing this in the OR, obviously you don't need to consider any of this other than antibiotic prophylaxis. And um, for most patients, they don't require any further um, numbing medications at all. Here, um, this is the step-by-step -step of how to deploy ITIN with a rigid cystoscope. This is a very easy, straightforward way to do it. What's one huge advantage of the rigid cystoscope is that it becomes a one-man operation. You don't need any other hands to help you. So in step one, you wanna place um, the rigid cystoscope within the patient. And you want to push the, um, once, a rigid, once you complete rigid cystoscopy, you want to um, break the scope and then place the crimped eye tint into the bladder. Then you remove the cystoscope itself and then advance the cystoscope parallel to the device for uh, visualization. You inflate the bladder with saline, flush as needed to ensure good visualization. Uh, do not attempt to position the device without a good visualization. And you want to uh, anchor the ITIN device at the six o'clock position. Pull the ITIN until the anchoring leaflet slides completely over the bladder neck uh, and ensure the fact that the external sphincter is closed around the device itself. You loosen the tied suture, remove the guide wire, empty the bladder, and then loop the retrieval suture and tape it to the penis. Again, very straightforward, easily done with no additional equipment. All you need is a rigid cystoscope in the ITIN system itself. For a flexible cystoscope, you need additional equipment, which includes a guide wire. Typically, I use a sensor guide wire and a 12 to 14 French ureteral axis sheath uh, for allowing the ITIN system to be deployed within the bladder itself. You can see on the third picture how the ITIN system is then placed within this um, within the bladder, uh, essentially placed blind. Managing the ITIN system with medications after discharge, again, very similar for both either done flexible scope or rigid scope. You would use pretium as needed, NSAIDs, Tylenol as per label, codeine, prednisone as needed as well, and very rarely oxybutynin. Removal of the ITIN system is the same irrespective of how the ITIN is placed, whether it's placed through a flexible scope or a rigid scope. Uh, anesthetic gel is in place into the urethral meatus and both ends of the catheter. The retrieval snare is then placed inside the catheter. Using the retrieval snare, it's threaded to get the retrieval suture through the catheter. The retrieval suture is then held taut, and the catheter is placed into the urethra to guide it until it meets the eye tint. Once the eye tint is fully collapsed, which you feel it collapse within the catheter, it's removed uh, end block. Most patients feel immediate relief of symptoms. A small percentage of patients have some mild dysuria. Most patients experience an improved stream immediately and patients void prior to discharge, irrespective of how it's placed and patients follow up four to six weeks after the procedure. Again, this is a minimally invasive FDA approved procedure, effective, well tolerated. It can be placed either rigid scope within the operating room or flexible scope within the office. In my practice, typically patients who have trouble tolerating office-based procedures, in other words, those who have difficulty with a flexible cystoscope itself, I typically will err to the side of doing it with a rigid scope within the operating room, which is very easy for the patient, or some for most patients who are able to tolerate flexible cyst cystoscopy without difficulty, these patients I will do it within the office. But again, this requires the additional use of additional equipment of a uh, guide wire, as well as a rural access sheath. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, I now have the opportunity to speak to you uh, regarding uh, my experience of the ITIND. Uh, my name is Neil Barber. I'm a urologist from the UK, and I've been involved with the ITIND now for six or seven years, initially in the MTO2 study. We've just heard from Dr. Chugdai about his technique of delivering uh, the ITIND device uh, under local anesthetic. Uh, in the uh, office, uh, and I'm going to talk to you now about the role of uh, delivering it in a more standard way, that is an operating room. But what is an operating room? Well, it doesn't have to mean uh, delivering and positioning the device in an operating room where one might be doing major surgery or robotic assisted surgery, 
that can still mean a minor operating room, uh, which is where I tend to perform the procedure, uh, therefore relieving pressures upon uh, a standard operating theatre and still creating a very ambulatory experience uh, and setting. There can be advantages, in fact, to performing uh, the insertion of the device under either sedation or general anaesthetic. This is particularly the case, I think, early on in one's experience, uh, but also um, those advantages are not only for you, the doctor, in terms of the security of positioning it without any concerns, but also for the patient who, of course, is then unaware of the whole experience. And those advantages can be at every step of that implantation procedure. You may remember um, that if you aren't going to use a rigid scope, you need a scope with a diameter of at least 19 French, and you can use a 12 or 30 degree telescope, whatever you're used to. You need no other uh, equipment, disposable otherwise, so this in sense may save some money. Um, and beyond that, in terms of anesthesia, one has a choice. We tend to do it under a propofol sedation, uh, as it's very quick and the patient wakes up very quickly and cleanly. We also then have the opportunity to give them interoperative analgesia, so to minimize discomfort as they do wake up. And I also give them dexamethasone, uh, as this I think has helped in terms of relieving postoperative discomfort. Once you pass the rigid cystoscope down the urethra to the bladder, this also gives you the opportunity to make sure that you haven't missed anything in terms of surprise findings, be it urethral strictures, a middle lobe which wasn't identified previously, or indeed any pathology within the bladder. And of course, perhaps even have the opportunity to manage that situation. This is something you can't do if you're performing it under local anaesthetic with a flexible cystoscope. When you introduce the uh, device into the bladder using the cystoscope sheath, you're not having to add in extra expensive equipment. Uh, this is standard off the shelf kit uh, and very familiar to use. When it comes to positioning the item, of course you have a better flow, a better orientation using a rigid scope, and that allows you to, particularly early on in one's experience, identify the different struts Make sure that you manipulate the device so that the positioning leaflet or tongue is at six o'clock before you then look to retract the device into a good position within the prostate and across the bladder neck. And indeed, you then have the opportunity to uh, examine that you have positioned it correctly. Furthermore, if there's any issues with positioning, that is that the leaflet is uh, not over the bladder neck, or you pull back too far so the struts aren't uh, sitting across the bladder neck, then you do have the opportunity to reposition it. Uh, you can collapse the device back within the cystoscope sheath and start the procedure again. So why perform the eye tint in the OR? Well, it does give you uh, the surgeon, the hospital, the predictability in terms of starting procedure and knowing that you're going to place it accurately. It gives the opportunity to manage unexpected findings, it minimizes the use of expensive equipment such as a ureteric access sheath to deliver the device into the bladder. Because of the orientation uh, with a rigid scope, that makes it easier to identify different parts of the device when you come to place, but particularly early on in one's experience. And as I mentioned, it gives you the ability to correct and manage any problems that may arise uh, during the implantation phase. For the patient, there are advantages too. They have a predictable experience again, they are asleep, they are unaware of what is going on, but it remains an ambulatory procedure with rapid uh, throughput uh, and passage through the hospital. What do I do after uh, implanting the eye tinned? Well, over the years, I've learned to try and minimize the symptoms with a, a simple um, concoction of medication. I warn the patient that they will have discomfort and pain in the perineum, uh, and possibly in the suprapubic area, they should expect to see blood and urine for the first 48 to 72 hours. There is little one can do about the storage type urinary symptoms of urgency that patients uh, tend to suffer when the device is in place. But in terms of discomfort, simple analgesia uh, in the form of paracetamol or paracetamol codeine mixes and non-steroidals if the patient can take it are very effective. But really the magic ingredient is a low dose of steroid and I tend to give them 10 milligrams of prednisolone to take once a day for the period of time that the implant is in place. I haven't seen any uh, 
positive or an advantageous role for the use of either anti-muscarinics or beta-3 agonists in terms of trying to minimize uh, the storage type symptoms that patients will have while the ITIN is in position. In terms of removal, we do remove that under local anesthetic in the outpatient uh, ambulatory setting five to seven days later. And my experience is that those symptoms that patients have while the device is in place settle down really very quickly indeed within 24 to 48 hours. And this allows the patient a rapid return to normal activity, really um, from start to finish then seven to nine days. It's that point that I suggest that uh, men can also stop their uh, any medication they'll be taking for their waterworks beforehand. So I hope I've made the case for thinking about uh, at least in the early part of one's experience, uh, performing insertion of the eye tinned uh, under sedation or general anesthetic in the operating room in whatever form that may be, uh, but also reinforced uh, the validity of removing it uh, as an outpatient under local anesthetic five to seven days later. Thank you very much. Definitely 
as far as my symptoms, uh, there was definitely an improvement after the first couple of days. And I distinctly remember there was a day, maybe, I don't know, four days in or whatever, where I actually texted my neurologist and I said, you can't believe this, I'm being like a racehorse. And then, uh, so after seven days, I had the implant uh, removed. And literally within a day of having it removed, it was just like, I texted my neurologist and said, I never knew it could be this good. That, uh, not only would the, the value of your urine stream be so much more than it had been, but that you could empty your bladder and come down. And for me, that was my issue all along. And to be able to have solved that problem within a week and know it's going to be a durable solution was just amazing. Uh, you know, I don't have to take the medications that I used to have to take for BPH, and it's just really awesome. If I had to give advice to somebody today who was just recently diagnosed with BPH, um, I would say ask your neurologist if you could just skip all the medicine and look and just go right to ITU. It's just so much nicer not to have to take medication for BPH every day. And if there's a procedure that can completely avoid that, I'd say go for it. If you're a candidate, go for it. It's been great for me, no side effects, and it's, uh, it's sort of changed my life to be honest. And then I had the ITU procedure to address BPH symptoms. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to present on ITEND for BPH and specifically focusing on clinical data. As we've already discussed, ITEND is a temporary implant for five to seven days, creates deep bloodless incisions created through ischemic pressure and necrosis, which permanently remodels the prostatic urethra and bladder neck. It was FDA approved in March of 2020. Uh, at the end of the five to seven days, the device effectively cuts to the tissue, opening the bladder outlet, relieving obstruction. Unlike dilation where tissue is torn, the gradual ischemic effect of ITIN does not cause bleeding. So typically bleeding is minimal while the device is placed and removed. And unlike other prosthetic stents, which serve as a scaffold, the ischemic incisions are permanent and the ITIN device is no longer required after their procedure. So there have been three published clinical studies, including over 280 patients. Here we've seen consistent results with IPSS reduction of 45 to 60%, QMAX increase of 50 to 100%, durable effect out to three years with less than a 9% reintervention rate. It's a catheter-free procedure. In my office and in my experience, I've had approximately 2 to 3% of patients requiring a catheter, but for the most part, pretty atypical and rare. Erectile ejaculatory function is fully preserved and it has the lowest rates of adverse events of any of the missed procedures with zero late occurring adverse events. On the left, we can see the IPSS where we see a dramatic improvement at the three month mark and lasting all the way out to 36 months. When we look at QMAX, we can see the same effect where there's a dramatic increase from a QMAX around seven up to around 14, 15, and again, durable out to three, three years. Here, we're going to hone in and focus on the uh, ITIN study done in the U.S., which is a multi-center randomized control trial. It assessed for eligibility in approximately 400 patients. 185 men were um, randomized. 118 underwent ITIN. 57 underwent SHAM. Uh, there was an intent to treat analysis at the three-month mark, and they were unblinded following that. Ultimately, per protocol analysis at 12 months had 78 patients. Here we can see the clinical uh, characteristics and demographics of both the ITIN and the SHAM group. We can see that the ages were well matched. 
Prostate volume was well matched between both groups at approximately 43 cc's. Qmax was equally low in both groups, 8.7 in I10 and 8.5 in CHAM. And sexual function was, again, well matched between both groups, where sexual function was actually slightly higher in the CHAM group. Here we can see a summary of functional results at the 12-month mark where we can see a paired analysis from all the way from 1.5 months all the way to 12 months. We can see that the IPSS improved by nine points at 12 months and durable from 1.5 months to there. When we look at QMAX, the improvement was approximately five uh, cc's per second, and again, durable out to 12 months. And again, we see the same with no change in SHIM or IIEF, where there was no change in sexual function. If we look at adverse events between ITIND and CHAM group, there was a total of um, 109 adverse, adverse events. 81 were deemed related to the study itself, and this occurred in 39 subjects. Ultimately, almost all groups had a complete resolution of uh, adverse events, where when we look out to the 3 to 12 month group um, time point, we can see only one patient had a adverse event at that point. Again, this is the lowest of any of the uh, missed procedures. Now, when we look at sexual function, we, we know that the gold standard medical and surgical treatments are associated with significant risk to sexual function. And the missed procedures um, have, been, uh, have grown significantly um, due to their ability to preserve sexual function. And the goal is to document the effect of ITIND on sexual function here. When we look at the 12-month group, we see there's no difference in SHIM or IIEF at 12 months compared to baseline, even when stratifying by age, prostate volume, or baseline ED status. When we did a subgroup analysis of the ITIND arm of specifically men 45 to 60 years old, they had improved sexual function compared to baseline at 12 months. And patients with that erectile dysfunction had improved IIEF score from baseline to 12 months. SHIM scores were unchanged in all groups. And there was no reports of any ejaculation decreased ejaculatory volume, painful ejaculation, or hematospermia in the ITIN group at all, therefore making it one of the procedures that are very good at preserving sexual function with little to no change. From this study, we're able to conclude that ITIN does not cause sexual and ejaculatory dysfunction in men, regardless of age, prostate volume, or baseline ED status. There were no patient reported ejaculatory adverse events compared to sham, and ITIN improved sexual function in younger men 45 to 60 with no baseline erectile dysfunction. Again, the, there needs to be larger studies done to show if there's truly an improvement in sexual function in all men or just a, a specific cohort. And again, this finding was not statistically significant. From this, we we're able to conclude that ITIN provides a safe, rapid, sustained improvement in LUTs to 12 months secondary to BPH and prostate volumes 25 to 75 cc's. This minimally invasive FDA-approved procedure is effective and well-tolerated while preserving both ejaculation and erectile function. Thank you. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about training and I'll give you some tips and tricks that I really hope can be helpful. Well, to be trained is key to success and Olympus well knows it and has developed several training pathways to educate the surgeons. ITIND has its own training pathway that is designed to maximize the success in incorporating this procedure into one clinician's healthcare organization. This pathway is composed by two main different steps that are the individual e-learning and the training session. The training session is composed by recruitment of five patients, the implantation and the removal of the device. 
Let me once again stress the fact that the adequate patient selection is essential to succeed and is mostly important in the first cases during which the urologist has to become familiar with the technique. Five, only five patients. This is the short learning curve required for the attend. That is a very easy procedure, as we have previously mentioned. The implantation day, the urologist has an expert on his side, and it is really suggested to perform under sedation the first three implantations, while the following may be optionally be, be performed without sedation under only local anesthetic. Similarly, in the removal day, the first three removals should be performed under sedation, while the following two may be optionally be performed without sedation under only local anesthetics. You should really ask Olympus to support you because they are very, very well organized and more than happy to do it. Now, let's have a look on recommendations. We have seen that the patient selection is essential. Clinical examinations, but also questionnaires, are part of the screening process. It is strongly recommended to record the IPSS score for all patients in order to have a baseline for follow-up visits and assessment of clinical results. PSA measurement is required too, such as Euroflowmetry plus post-voiding residual measurement, and surely the prostate volume and the prostatic shape must be known. A ultrasound scan is mandatory, better a transrectal one, and it is strongly recommended to evaluate the patient with a cystoscopy. Cystoscopy, in fact, helps to rule out the presence of eventually urethral strictures, obstructive median lobe, high bladder neck, or the presence of bladder stones. The CISTO will also help to better understand whether the patient would be an appropriate candidate for a procedure without sedation, if that is the goal. I generally perform the CISTO at the end of which I talk with the patients and I discuss with him the indication. Yes, because counseling. Counseling is another strong recommendation. We need to take the time to talk with the patient, to answer to all his questions. And remember that even our nonverbal attitude must be open, ready to listen. Patients have symptoms, have problems, but they also have desires. They have expectations, also in terms of immediate and long-term results. And we have to remind to take into consideration the partner points of view that in many cases can really influence the final patient decision. We have to remember that some topics and some aspects might be difficult to be delivered. So be open and listen to our patient. I also suggest to useful, give to, sorry, I also would like to underline that it's very useful to give patients as much information as we can in order to prepare them for the procedure and for the five, seven days symptoms while the IT is in situ. In fact, the largest part of patients describe the IT procedures as being a little uncomfortable. Some of them report mild to moderate discomfort, but we have to ensure the patients that there are adequate medications to perfectly manage all symptoms. And what have we learned? And saying we, I mean all of us that perform it. Technical aspects, first of all. So it's important to distend the bladder enough to manipulate it into position without hurting the bladder wall. And it's also important to irrigate the pro properly to see during the maneuver. And it's also necessary to acquire the good maneuver skills in order to properly coordinate hands to hold the scope at the bladder neck. So the advice is to start from a rigid scope technique and to have a smooth progression to a flexible technique. When you hopefully try this procedure, you agree with the fact that it's a very easy procedure with a short learning curve. Well, other lessons learned. It's really necessary 
to k to sorry and now other lessons learned so it's necessary to carefully take care of the preparation of the patients every detail every aspect even more if the procedure is performed under local anesthesia the surgeon have to be in charge of everything including the patient's position on the bed remember to carefully check if his head is comfortably placed to avoid abdominal or pelvic contraction that may might make the procedure more uncomfortable we have to make the patient comfortable for example i always ask the patients which is his favorite music and i use my loudspeaker to play it and i ask to one nurse to go on the patient's side to distract him talking for example about his family his passions his pets and all lessons are really important but it's also important to remember that there are medications that have to be used before and after the procedure in these slides i present the protocol used by the canadian colleagues but different centers in different countries all over the world can have their own protocol i personally perform the procedure only in local anesthesia injecting cold lidocaine and cold lidocaine jelly 20 minutes before the procedure clamping the penis with a penile clamp and before inserting the cystoscope, both the rigid or the flexible one, I inject again colidocaine and colidocaine jelly. If I have the perception that the patient is anxious or if he complains some discomfort, or even if he asks me, I premedicate him with benzodiazepam and narcotics. During the procedure, I don't have an um, I don't have an anesthesiologist with me. I only have a nurse who assist me, so I have to be really in charge of everything. After the IT deployment, the patients may describe feeling of dysuria associated with pain or pressure in the perineal area. Sometimes they also complain about the some urgency and frequency. Acute retention is very rare, such as mild hematuria that generally lasts only 48 hours. Sometimes they can also complain discomfort due to the presence of their trivial suture. Well, these are the Canadian suggestions to face the symptoms, one among all the available literature. But what do I personally do? Paracetamol, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, phytotherapics, cortisone suppositories, alpha blockers, prednisone and oxybutynin when required for short for short term do not prescribe only medications but remember to give also lifestyle counseling among them tell the patients to increase their water intake to avoid bladder irritants and to use petroleum jelly well with these tricks the largest part of the patients have a positive experience and globally consider the, the treatment only a little uncomfortable. Patients have my number and patients have my email. Okay, you might think that I'm crazy, but I have noticed that if the patient knows that he has a direct way to contact me, he is really more confident and faces the post-operative days with more serenity. So this is not a recommendation, but a lesson that I have personally have learned. Well, the same recommendations are important for the device removal. Remember that the device removal is generally an outpatient procedure. So it's really important to make the patient comfortable. And it's important to use lots of jelly, both in the urethra and into the catheter to lubricate. And uh, what happens? after the dietin has been removed. Patients have to know that uh, they will have immediate relief, or sometimes they might have mild dysuria, hematuria, and sometimes urgency, but only generally for two weeks. And they have to know that we'll have the maximal benefit after three months. Well, I really hope that these tips and these tricks will be useful for your daily practical clinic with dietin. Here you've got my email. If you want to uh, write me an email and ask me my mobile number, there are no problem. I will be more than happy to help you. Thank you again for your attention.
So uh, thank you very much to our uh, contributors and presenters for those excellent talks regarding this uh, novel procedure uh, and its place in the minimally invasive surgical treatment armamentarium for symptomatic benign prostate disease. We're now just going to get together and have a discussion about the device, about what we've heard, and perhaps sum things up so there's some take-home messages for you in terms of uh, what you might have learned about ITIND and what place you may think it has in your treatment of patients going forward. I think one of the main things that we picked up from the presentations was the real importance about patient selection uh, and how that may influence the uh, likelihood of getting a positive outcome for both the patient and therefore for you in terms of feeling as though you've done a good job for them in terms of decision making. Um, I think that generally um, we're hearing that it's about younger patients and of course we'd expect that given that it's uh, a procedure with a, essentially zero risk of negative impact upon sexual function. But if I could, we heard obviously from Dr. Seko from her talk about her thoughts, but perhaps uh, Luca, you could share with us what kind of patient you think uh, is ideal and how you go about making that selection. Thank you, Neil. Uh, of course, this uh, device is perfect for a patient affected by BPH, symptomatic BPH, requiring uh, a preservation of every uh, um, sexual function, both ejaculatory and erectile. Uh, this kind of device is perfect, again, for some kinds of prostates. Um, from the literature, we learned that it is perfect for prostate between 30 to even 60, even 80 grams. But in the real life, especially in the clinical trial, the prostate volume that is treated medially is around 37 to 40 milliliters. The shape of the prostate is another crucial point in the selection of the patient, especially because the IT end is able to incise the blood and neck in three parts, in three points, and it is better to exclude the patient affected with BPH and third lobe. So my suggestion is to select uh, men um, who desire to preserve ejaculation and erection at all uh, with a prostate of medium volume without third lobe. This is the best candidate in my opinion. And I think in that uh, kind of patients, success rate is very high and the perception of the patient is uh, more or less highly appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Shuktai, what, uh, what kind of uh, New York man comes to you to, uh, to uh, explore the option of ITIND as a, as a treatment for him? Yes, I would say in the United States and specifically in New York, patients who are looking for a treatment that preserves sexual function, little to no downside, no energy delivered, these are the patients who are really looking for, for ITIN. And I would agree with Luca in his assessment that high bladder necks, no middle lobe, these are the patients that do remarkably well with ITIN. Lovely, thank you. And I mean, also, I, I also hear from men who are attracted by the option of having no implant. You know, that is That can be a big thing, particularly in this modern era with lots of what's gone on with vaginal tapes, et cetera. Uh, Dr. Seko, having heard um, from uh, Dr. Chinjolo and Chuktai, have you got anything you'd like to add beyond your presentation earlier in terms of just picking the right Italian man for the for this procedure? Well, Italian or not, I, I agree with what the colleagues said, but I would also add that I exclude for the indication on um, patients that have a bladder impairment or patients that have diverticula or uh, a detrusorial function that is not good because I don't think that in that case is there will be a good outcome. So I prefer to avoid that kind of patient too. Within the data sets, there's no there's nothing of any quality, at least, that might relate to men presenting in acute urinary retention, so may well have good bladders, or indeed who have had uh, other kinds of treatments, such as radiotherapy to the prostate, for instance. Do you have any experience or any thoughts about the role of the device in that setting? I don't have. I have treated one patient with acute urinary retention. As you have said, it's not a problem of lung impairment, so it's just an acute an acute situation. And in fact, he was happy with the, after the procedure. 
I don't have any experience with the radiation therapy, but why not? We should try at least if it's the best option for the patient. If he has no other possibilities, why not try with him? Because some of that patients maybe have small prostate, they have a long waiting list to be resected, for example, in uh, in Italian actual situation. And so why not? If you can uh, try to do them. We know that there are experience all over the world on that, in that sense. So I personally don't try, but I didn't try, but I would. Dr. Chikdai, any thoughts about sort of... I, 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 would, the I would completely agree. I mean, if there's a population, I think that would really benefit from that. When you talk about the post-radiation setting, that's that population that's extremely delicate and we're very concerned about downside. And I think ITIN has a lot of potential promise there. Um, I have not treated uh, radiated patients, but um, I've heard good outcomes from them as well. And Dr. Chindono? I agree. I agree that there is a space for... Uh, improvement in this kind of patients. I will also highlight the importance of the IT in, in patients with the recurrent blood their neck stricture. Okay, mm. now it's out of indications, clear, but in the future, this kind of patient after, for example, um, QRP stricture or after enucleation, uh, if they can develop some diaphragm on the blood their neck, I think they can be treated successfully with IT. It is out of indication for now, but in the future we can think about. Well, it was always going to be a very difficult thing to get any much data about because it's not that common a thing, one hopes. Uh, you know, it's a recognized complication, you say, of any thermal based receptive procedure. But uh, I certainly have heard, again, I think from a colleague of yours, in fact, in Rome, about the use of it in, in uh, men with blood and neck contractures following TRP and lasers and uh, with good results. So, yeah, certainly maybe that's something to think about. Uh, for our colleagues out there in the future. So just turning now to the technique, and we've heard uh, from all our presenters really about the different ways of essentially delivering and positioning the device. Uh, there's the option of performing it under a sort of deeper sedation slash GA in the operating room and using rigid equipment, which you've got to hand all the time. But there's also the option of uh, performing it in a truly ambulatory out office or outpatient setting under local. Um, Dr. Shukdai, I know you presented about the, the uh, local anesthetic uh, approach and the office approach. What are your thoughts though, about how one would go forward to introduce that uh, in the setting? And also just a little bit about the cost, because you are using bits of kit that aren't really designed for that purpose and do have a little badge of money attached to them, particularly the ureteric access sheath. Um, and you know what implications that may have. Yeah, so I, I would say that um, when first starting off the procedure, um, doing it with a rigid scope definitely makes it a lot easier. Uh, I also think that the rigid scope also makes it virtually a one-person operation, right? You're able to do this yourself. Um, you might an, an extra set of hands always help, but you can essentially do it yourself. When you turn it to a flexible procedure, you definitely need a second set of hands. You definitely need extra equipment like a guide wire and a ubiquitous acid sheet, which does add cost to the procedure. Um, right now in the in the U.S., it's not really covered in the office, so it's an out-of-pocket expense for the patient. So it does add some expense. But I do think that for patients who tolerate office-based procedures well, in other words, when you're doing a flexible cystoscopy, they describe it as you know virtually painless. Someone who tolerates a transrectal ultrasound as being virtually painless. These patients can do very well with a flexible procedure in the office and in, in the U.S. at least, the office is probably one of the most efficient places where you can treat patients. So getting them in, treating them is a lot easier than taking up operating room time, which can sometimes be a little bit more challenging. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Seca, how, can you tell us about your sort of pathway in terms of how you deliver this and how you choose your patient in those different settings and what tricks there are perhaps to make it the least unpleasant experience possible if they're awake? Um, okay, actually, in Italy, there's a problem of reimbursement of this kind of procedures. So um, to balance the, the cost of the devices and the reimbursement, I perform the procedure in a, a day surgery. Okay, so in a one day, I don't keep the patients to sleep. I perform both the flexible treatment and the, the, the rigid one in local anesthesia. I don't have an anesthesiologist, an anesthesiologist with me as a previously mentioned during my presentation, I only have a nurse. So I have to eventually 
uh, add some benzodiazepine and narcotics to the patient. But um, if I'm totally alone, I prefer a rigid technique because, as doctor said, it's really feasible if you're alone. Uh, if I'm not alone, I, I can perform also a flexible one. And I only inject cold lidocaine and cold lidocaine generally 20 minutes before the procedures. And I add the narcotics and the benzodiazepine if the patient requires or in the, the other situation that I've mentioned during the, the presentation. So probably my hospital is a little bit a different situation from the others. I don't, I never use the operatory room. I use a, a dedicated room where we do cystoscopies or stand positioning. So it's a completely separated uh, situation. It's not a theater at all. So maybe uh, these might uh, help who's listening to us and seeing us, that it's really a minimally invasive technique and that you can perform without uh, the needs of uh, surgical theater, surgical room. Okay. And Dr. Chindolo, how, have you got anything to add to that in terms of your experience? Would you, would you advocate people starting off a service using local anesthesia straight away? Uh, no, I would say I started with rigid cystoscopy. I still performing a rigid, rigid cystoscopy with a very short and mild sedation, intravenous sedation, um, for both implant and also removal of the itin. Why? Because I am working now in a very um, specific environment. This is a private hospital in Italy, and the minimal requirement from the patient, the patient is I don't like to feel nothing. I don't, I don't need to have pain. I, I cannot tolerate nothing. Sometimes they ask also to have anesthesia before uh, to come in, in, the, in the office. So <laughs> sometimes it's, it's tricky. So, so for me, okay. it's intravenous sedation. Intravenous sedation, yeah. Now, I mean, this is what I like to do. I mean, obviously our patients aren't quite as brave as those in the north of Italy, but the, uh, in, in terms of under local anesthetic. Um, I think one of the things I learned years and years ago when I was part of the MTO2 study, uh, was if you got that wrong and patients were developed quite a lot of pain after insertion of the device, that was that was a pretty bad place to be in and, and, in, and in many ways irretrievable in terms of their experience of the device being in place. Um, for me, the, 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 the magic wand that I picked up from Professor Popilio in Torino was, was giving them steroids along with simple analgesia afterwards. And it was really that single maneuver for me that changed everything. Uh, really quite incredible. Um, I don't know, have... have you have, have any of you had any sort of special ingredients to the process and the medication, particularly when the device is in there, which you think is important, Dr. Seco? I agree with the steroids, then also non anti inflammatory drugs. And don't laugh, but I also believe that some phytotherapy might be really useful for patients. Mm -hmm. And also some cortisone suppositories can be also very, very useful. And in case of urgency, why not oxybutynin for short term? Um, paracetamol, maybe every eight hours or six hours, is just to give the patient uh, the, the, the benefits for three or four days. That, and I think that will be enough to cover all the symptoms. Mm. Dr. Chukda, have you any, anything you have to add? I mean, I think that's a tick for steroids there again, or is it in terms of its importance afterwards? I, I think it's just remarkable that across the globe, we all figured out the same thing because um, I find the same ingredients work equally as well. Um, what I've also found is that I usually tell patients up front as well, saying that, look, we're going to put this device in. Everyone has different tolerances for how well you can take this device. And I'm not going to leave you in a position where you're going to be in pain or discomfort. And I tell patients, look, if this, for whatever reason, you're not able to tolerate this, um, I'll take it out. I'll take it out early. But give me a chance with a combination of anti-inflammatories, steroids, whatever you need. And for a lot of patients, just knowing that there's a bunch of things that we can do helps them tolerate the device really well. Lovely. Uh, and Dr. Chindler, what have you found, what's been your experience uh, in terms of once the device is removed, which I think would be lovely to touch on, but we're going to run out of time a bit. But in terms of removal, so I think we all perform as an ambulatory outpatient setting. Um, how quickly is it, or do you find that patients reporting returning to normal activity? Because I think this is one of the really key things for me about this device. Yeah, I, I would say that it's it's usually like a day or two where I, I think the remarkable difference between when having the device in and out, patients feel much, much better. 
and it's very quick that they're going back to activities of daily life. Absolutely. Dr. Chindalone, what's been your experience in terms of the speed of return to normal activity? The, the speed of recovery is, is extremely high. I will say two or three days after the removal, the patient experienced an, an, an impressive improvement in terms of, of uh, urinary symptoms. This is absolutely true. Uh, I think the, the week of the implant, the days when they have the, the implant, uh, in, in the prostate uh, is sufficiently um, painful sometimes, and the, the cocktail of, of the drug you said are completely the same I use. And I think we can also start with some medication before the patient experiences the pain, because the memory of the pain, the experience of physical pain, is not uh, is not helping the patient in 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 the in his pathway. So I start from the first day to administer paracetamol and steroids from the day one. But after the removal, I stop all the drugs, including alpha blockers. I don't know what's your management of alpha blockers in these patients. Dr. Seco, what's your management of alpha blockers in these patients? No, I leave, the, I leave them for at least 20 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, let me add just one thing. I think that the counseling that we have to do before the, the implant is really, really important. We have to make patients aware of what they will face. And uh, um, I try to be as much uh, available for the patient as, as I can. I, I mean, I leave him my mobile, they have my emails because no, they won't disturb it. But if they know that they can contact me, the patient will probably be feel better and uh, uh, yes, being more more happy and satisfied with the procedure, knowing that someone will be there to answer, and not only giving him indication, but also listening to them when he said, "Okay, my God, I'm feeling pain." Okay, don't worry, it's fine. Uh, it will it will go. It will pass after two days of the removal. And I agree with you that after two week, after two days, the patient will be will be better. Right. So I think that's quite a, one of the important attractive points of it. And is it, it although there's a certain period of time when it's in and there's various related symptoms which you've outlined it's the, the, the sort of start to finish of leaving normal activity to back to full normal activity is as, as quick if not quicker than anything else out there really um let's move on i think to uh the data a little bit um recently uh, the uh, national national institute of uh, clinical excellence in the uk uh, had a look at the 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 data which you presented uh, and uh, through the Inter Interventional Procedures Committee gave guidance, uh, but didn't give it full guidance, suggesting that there were some holes in that data and the body of it before they would give it the full tip. And particularly that relates uh, to um, long-term data, but we just wonder whether, you know, what are we looking for, do we think, for our patients when we discuss this as an option? What is it, the, what holes do we think are there that need filling uh, going forward in terms of getting a good body of evidence, both for people like NICE in the UK, but also for patients themselves, of course. Uh, Dr. Chugtai. I would say the initial data and also being part of um, the iTunes studies, we have really good initial data and even interim uh, long data. But I do think we need long-term data to help counsel our patients as to chances of retreatment, chances of coming off of medication. So I do think there are there are holes in the data there. But at, in the initial data we're looking at, both internationally and in the U.S., uh, look extremely promising for retreatment rates, catheterization rates, and keeping people off medications. Lovely. And Dr. Seco, I, mean, I know in the European Association guidelines of this year, they do they too make reference to a lack of complete data sets in terms of you know giving it a place within the guidelines. Um, what do you think we should be looking at going, going forward and how do you discuss this with your patients in terms of the lack of that data? Mm, I agree. In fact, in our guidelines, it's still considered under investigation, this kind of procedure, because of lack of longer term data. And uh, yes, we uh, have to tell the patient that we don't know how much the procedure will will be will make the patient happy. And I always tell the patient that. But I also tell them that maybe there can be space for retreatment. Why not? With the same device, with other devices, it's some that is completely new, that's in, still in evolving, that's 
evolving. So maybe we can uh, treat the patients with something new or again, the same device after some years, two, three, six, we will see. It depends also on the patients, on how the patient is or which are his expectations, on how old is he? Because if it's a 30 years old man, it's different to treat a 45 years old man that after five years might have different expectations. And so he won't be still motivated to ejaculate, but wants a better flow, for example. So we always Always have to be very uh, aware of the patient that we have in front. Lovely, thank you, D Dr. Chindler. Just before uh, to wrap up, really, I think you know it, we understand that ITIN is a minimally invasive surgical treatment. We've seen that it is quick, can be formed under local anesthesia or under sedation, essentially in an ambulatory fashion. We have seen the data; it's effective. We've got uh, reproducible data uh, with a degree of longevity. Um, where do you see the place of ITIN, though, in a field which already has a number of different options, uh, specifically Eurolift, which is in the EAU guidelines you know, as a recommended treatment, but also resume? And if men come to you thinking about a minimally invasive option as opposed to a standard resecting or cavitating option, how do you have that discussion about the role of ITIN in one patient as opposed you know, as a as a benefit over one of the other different minimally invasive surgical treatments? Um, thank you, Neil, for this question. That is a matter of everyday practice. Yeah. So when I find a, a patient, when a patient comes to me asking for a treatment for, for palliation of symptoms, I analyze, as I said before, the, the parameters we know, the shape of the prostate, the, the volume of the prostate, the expectation of the patient, and also the capability to tolerate the first part of post-operative course patient that cannot tolerate even psychologically a catheter, of course, is not candidate for resume or other catheter requiring techniques. Patient that uh, is not familiar with an implant, a definitive implant, we can offer, of course, ITIN instead of Eurolift. So for me, it's a matter of uh, patient preferences. I spend time I spent also um, investment in terms of explanation, drawings, and informed the consent. I spent a lot of time with patients, and uh, overall, I have to start with an indication uh, on, on, the, on the clinical parameters. But I will say the key of success in my, in my office is to listen a lot to patients. And of course, we should all listen to our patients. Dr. Chugtai, how do you, how do you uh, frame a discussion about the different minimum invasive surgical treatment to a patient and the place of an ITIN within that? I agree with Luca. You, you need to counsel the patient and make sure they're aware of the different options available and make sure you take the preference and count to like therapy. So I think the, uh, so finally, Dr. Seko, um, so who, who it is, you, you I know, perform Eurolift, you perform ITIN. How do you make the choice in terms of, or help the patient make their choice, I should say, guide them along their journey uh, in that conversation about how they make a decision about what procedure they would like? Um, I also have resume in my pocket, so and also uh, prostatic artery embolization. I can offer a lot to patients, but for ITIN, it's really um important to uh extract from all the patients that one that we have previously said so the one with the high bladder neck with major disease with small prostate that all other devices won't won't be able to treat because there are they have different characteristics because we know that with other techniques we need to stay at least one centimeter or one centimeter and a half from the bladder neck for example while in patients that have a stricture in the bladder neck i think can be the perfect solution so uh it has some characteristics that the other devices doesn't have don't have so this is my first decision when I talked a lot, again, also me, to the patient offering the IT in the... Lovely. I think on that note is, is uh, time to draw this discussion to a close. I hope that everybody's enjoyed uh, listening to the presentation by expert panellists here regarding IT in and its role as a minimally invasive surgical treatment. Uh, we've explored how it works. Uh, the evidence behind it, the published evidence behind it, and learn how, how to, to uh, deliver it and position it as well as remove it and understand that it's a truly ambulatory, minim minimally invasive procedure. 
which carries uh, the attraction of no impact upon sexual function at all. Um, I would like to thank now our panelists, Dr. Chindolo from Rome, uh, Dr. Chugdai from New York, and Dr. Seko from Milan. Uh, and thank you very much for uh, watching and listening to this program. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We are constantly improving a surgical training. This is why we need you to participate in our AIS core initiative to rate the quality of our content. You can rate our content by giving it a score from 0 to 10. 0 meaning not useful and 10 meaning extremely useful. You can tell us if this is a good content to share. Thank you for your commitment to the democratization of surgical training.